Okay, welcome everyone to today's research webinar by Professor Anandya Ghosh from New York Stern. In Stern. So Professor Ghosh's topic is on mobile targeting using customer trajectory patterns. Uh, so before we get started in the talk, let me give you a quick introduction about uh, Professor Anandya Ghosh. He is the Heinz Ryle Chair Professor of Technology and Marketing at the New York's Leonard and Stern School of Business where he holds a joint appointment in TOPS, which is a technology, operations management, statistics, and marketing department. So most of the practitioners world know Anindya as the author of the book TAP, which is a very popular book, and it has got many awards. Uh, he's also runs, he also runs the uh, Masters of Business Analytics program at NYU Stern. In fact, I have heard Anindya's many interviews and podcasts and find them often very insightful. Uh, so if I continue to read his full bio, the audience will not like it because it will take a lot of time from the speaker itself. But I'll highlight some of his major accomplishments. Uh, in 2014, he was named by Poets and Coins as one of the top 40 professors under 40. So this really says about his uh, teaching and how he's liked by the students. He's also the youngest recipient of the prestigious Informs ISS Distinguished Fellow Award. He's also the winner of the NSF Career Award, which is one of the biggest award that a young faculty can obtain from the federal government. His research has mostly spanned across different areas, but most prominently his work is in the area of product reviews, reputation and rating systems, digital marketing, data privacy trade-offs, sponsor research advertising, wearable technologies, mobile commerce, mobile advertising, crowdfunding, and online markets. Uh, Anindya has written many uh, news articles that are in popular like BBC, Bloomberg TV, CNBC, China Daily to just mention a few of them. Uh, at Stern and at many places in the world, he teaches courses on social media, digital marketing, business analytics, and IT strategy to undergraduate, graduate, EMBA, MSBA, exec at different levels. So without much delay from the speaker, I would uh, request Anindya, you can take the floor. So the pattern is the following. We'll, uh, we'll take the talk uh, as Anindya goes through. If you have any pressing questions, please use the chat window to write any questions and I will moderate it as we go. Uh, if there are no questions, we'll have the talk for 45 minutes or so, and then we'll take some of the questions from the audience. Yeah. So without much delay, it's all to you. Anindya. Okay. Thank you, Devji. Thanks for inviting me and, and for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be here and to be able to share with you all some of the work that we've been doing in the mobile economy. Uh, the paper I'll present today is joint work with uh, my uh, ex-student. She's now a, a rising star and a very successful professor at Carnegie Mellon, Bebe Lee, and um, with C1 Liu, who was a postdoc as well, and he's now at Penn State. Um, so to so give you some background first, what we're going to do in this paper is talk about you know, how we can mine this very granular atomic data sets that come out of smartphones, uh, given the, the massive proliferation and the ubiquity of smartphones. Uh, we're gonna talk about some experiments that we ran uh, in some of the world's largest shopping malls. Um, I probably won't have time to talk about all of them, but I'll talk about the biggest one. Um, and then we'll, you know, we'll sort of uh, talk about, you know, what exactly are we comparing this and, and, and what are we trying to ascertain? Okay? Um, so the background, I would say, is as follows. You know, some of you have probably come across the book that they did mention. I wrote this, you know, a couple of years back, where um, I highlighted all of the academic research that's been done in the mobile economy, and also added a bunch of my own non-academic work. I, I do a lot of work with companies all over the world, so I summarized some of those projects and those in the book as well. And you can think of you know, mobile-based advertising as categorized into three buckets. Okay, so you've got something called geo-targeting, something called geo-fencing, and geo-conquesting. So, so geo-targeting essentially means location-based targeting, but within a very short distance. Um, geo-fencing tends to be much more broader, uh, maybe a few hundred meters, for instance. You're walking out in downtown, and you know, uh, a number of stores within 500 meters of where you are can create a fence around you by essentially tapping into your smartphone location data and then send you offers. And then geoconquesting is this uh, sort of, you know, uh, your rival poaching upon your customer. So imagine Nike and Adidas having stores close to each other. Every time a customer walks into Nike's store, Adidas sends them an offer on the phone. That's called geoconquesting. Okay? So 
my co-authors and I, you know, we've done a bunch of work in this space over the last decade or so. Um, we had initially looked at pure location-based targeting, you know, meaning that what if uh, a brand or a store or, or a marketer knew a customer's real-time location at this point, um, how would they leverage and harness that? And, you know, what could they do with that? Um, we also did some work combining location with time because that gives you more context, you know, like, uh, think about, uh, you know, Sunday at 9 a.m., for instance, uh, in, in, think about Mumbai, right? So Sunday at 9 a.m. in the 91.20 area is a very different context than Monday at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. in the same uh, location, right? So when you combine location and time, you get a, a deeper sense of context. Um, and then following that work, we did some additional work, um, and there's other papers, uh, other people as well who've done some very interesting work. Um, and uh, one of my students, Michelle Andrews and, and Xiaoming Lo, we worked on looking at crowdedness in very public transportation, right? So looking at subway trains, for example, uh, how does that influence your uh, responses to mobile advertising? Um, we also looked at, you know, stress. And uh, when, when public transportation is very crowded, right, it also might create stress. Um, and again, uh, you know, I won't get into details, but the point here being that, you know, a number of these, um, you know, real-time location-based questions have been answered, but turns out that, you know, up until this particular project, what nobody had really looked up in the past was, instead of just your static location, what is the new for, a, you know, your historical location trajectory for, for a considerable period of time, you know? In other words, instead of just saying, okay, this customer is standing in front of Starbucks right now, what is the new that this customer was in a shopping mall before that uh, he went to Dunkin' Donuts, from there he went to Seattle's Coffee, from there he came to Prada Manger. And okay, so um, what happens if you know people's trajectory over a longer period of time? then can that be helpful in getting more information about the customer's intent or context? Okay. So this is, the, this is the context that we're gonna tackle today, right? So can we better understand and improve the decision-making process by analyzing the trajectory data of people, right? Okay, so I'll give you some more examples, but before I go there, uh, for those of us who are interested in figuring out what else has been done. Um, you know, the, the book that I mentioned, um, I identified nine forces that are shaping this mobile economy. And, and some of these forces have been well studied, but many of them have barely been studied. So I personally foresee a lot of, you know, um, opportunities for further academic research. Um, look, at the end of the day, they all start with location. Location is fundamental, it's a building block. But location can add a lot more nuance to additional forces if you can, you know, just think about uh, the context, the time, the crowdedness, the weather. Each of these forces separately is able to increase the advertising effectiveness of companies, uh, but there are also synergies between them, you know, like weather and crowdedness, you can find synergies there. Or today we'll talk about trajectory and social dynamics, you can find synergies there. Okay? Okay, so now let's take a, a specific uh, look at the research question, all right? So we are gonna look at a new mobile advertising strategy that leverages not only the static location information, but also consumers' mobile trajectory, okay? And we're gonna measure the impact of this trajectory we are targeting on the shopping behavior and the revenues of these companies. Uh, in case I don't get to the end, I wanted to give you a summary of what we do and what we find. Um, so I'll, I walk you through this new trajectory-based advertising technique. Uh, it's going to be a combination of some machine learning analysis, machine learning methods with some, um, you know, randomized field experiments. Um, we had partnered with a few different, you know, corporate partners. Uh, the one I'll talk about today is a very large shopping mall in Asia. Uh, I believe it is the largest mall in Asia. We carried out this uh, field experiment over a two week period and uh, we were able to partner with 252 unique stores. Okay, they had, the mall had about 300 stores. So roughly about 20% of them uh, or 16% you know, opted out, but the remaining 80, 85% decided to participate with us. 
So what do we find? Well, basically we find that, you know, trajectory based targeting does lead to higher redemption rates. More people are redeeming their offer. People are spending more money. They are more satisfied. And more importantly, they're also uh, fast uh, redeeming them quicker compared to the other benchmarks. Okay. Uh, we also find that uh, you know it does benefit the focal advertising store. Um, overall, shopping mall revenues go up as well. But interestingly, there is a difference between weekday and weekend. Okay, and I'll come to that later on. Uh, we also look at some socioeconomic demographic information. We look at you know how income affects this sort of response to advertising. And in fact, somewhat surprisingly, we did find that higher income people are more likely to uh, redeem these offers. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about what exactly is going on here. What what does trajectory based clustering look like? Um, then we'll talk about the experiment. Then I'll talk about the results, and then I'll conclude. Okay. okay so imagine this is a typical you know large shopping mall or a large department store, right? Like think about the the you know Macy's or a shopper stop in India, for example, right? Uh, but much bigger than that. Now, can you see the Apple store um, on the left top, right? You can see the Apple store, right? Now, imagine that, you know, Apple thinks that this gentleman over here, he's, you know, um, in his white shirt and, and dark slack, if they're looking at location, just real-time location, they will infer that this gentleman is standing in front of Apple store. He might be interested in buying an Apple right, product. So yeah? um, but what may also happen is, there maybe is a bunch of false positive because maybe you know he's just standing there waiting for a friend and he's really not interested in any apple product it's simply a landmark you know how like sometimes we go to a mall and we tell our friends hey wait for me in front of the starbucks store right and then when we come let's go grab a coffee so maybe this friend uh, this person is waiting for a friend and um, as soon as the friend comes they just start walking past so if Apple only uses the current location, then they're going to generate a bunch of false positives. Okay? And they're going to send a bunch of irrelevant offers to people who don't have any interest in Apple. Okay? So that's one of the downsides of pure location-based targeting because you're only using real-time data. Now suppose instead of that, what Apple knew is this gentleman, before he came to the Apple store, he first came to the Samsung store right here, okay? There's a Samsung store on the second floor. Then from the Samsung store, he went into the basement. There is an Oppo store, Oppo, the, you know, the Chinese brand. From Oppo, he goes to maybe Xiaomi, the Xiaomi store. Then he goes to, from the Xiaomi store, he goes to the Huawei store. And then finally, he comes to the Apple store. So if you can observe a customer's trajectory for the preceding few minutes, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is, it can be more informative than simply looking at the current location data. Okay, so that's what we mean by trajectory. We mean that instead of location-based targeting, can we actually do trajectory-based targeting? And if so, um, you know, how does this increase the revenues and targeting effectiveness? Anindra, there is a quick question here. Yeah. Um, so yeah. a few participants want to ask, like, how do they know, come to know about the floor location of the person, the vertical coordinates? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Good point. So, you know, the today's smartphones, they come with a bunch of, you know, uh, very sophisticated sensors. We have accelerometer, gyrometer, barometer, and et cetera. So when we look at the location data, right, um, the location data is able to infer both the horizontal latitude, longitude, and the vertical coordinates within uh, about three feet of your actual location with 97% accuracy. Okay? And within one feet with 91% accuracy. So this goes towards both vertical and horizontal uh, distance. Okay? And there's a follow-up question as well, if you want to take it right now. Is sure. what yeah, happens please, please. if the customer visits clothing stores instead of mobile stores before reaching the Apple location? Yeah, great question. Um, absolutely. This is also informative, right? So we do see some customers who are hopping across categories, okay? And we call them the explorers. 
So we have focus shoppers. Focus shoppers are basically very homogeneous in their, you know, inter-category shopping. There is a shopping within the same category. And then we also have explorers who maybe they go to a grocery store, then a fashion store, then, you know, then come to a smartphone store. Yeah. Um, and in fact, that, these are exactly the kinds of information that you will see we are going to leverage in our machine learning based uh, recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So what are we going to do first? Well, first thing what we're going to do is we are going to model consumer similarity from these trajectories, you know, uh, like basically saying, there's an old saying, right? Like great minds think alike. We are saying that great minds move alike meaning that people who have similar preferences, right, they typically tend to have similar shopping trajectories. So we're gonna define a community as a set of people with similar mobile trajectories, okay? Now, how do we define similarity? This is where, you know, the, the second question that somebody asked, uh, and in fact, both the questions are very relevant here. So similarity is a function of very, diverse aspects of your trajectory. So are you visiting similar stores or are you visiting different stores? Are you visiting a similar time, like weekend or weekday, uh, morning, evening, afternoon or night? Do you have similar shopping speed? You know, as you walk, your walking speed is indicative of, you know, are you a focused shopper or are you an explorer? Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take all of this data and I'll, I'll dig a little more deeper in the next slide and these dimensions. And then we're going to rely on, uh, you know, graph-based clustering. These are basically, think of them like dense subgraph detection to figure out which two customers are similar to each other, okay? So what are the different dimensions of this? Well, first of all, let's look at spatial alignment, right? So the first question that somebody asked is, you know, can you distinguish between the floors? And absolutely, it's a great question because it's a very key aspect of our targeting. We, you know, if you look at the red trajectory and the blue trajectory, these are two different people, but they have a very similar trajectory. They go from the first floor to the fifth floor, then to the third floor, then the seventh floor, you know, they keep doing that. Um, and so both the horizontal and the vertical dimensions are important. So we categorize them as spatial. The second category of similarity between two customers is temporal, okay? So are they starting and ending at the same time? Is it the weekend or weekday? you know, those sort of things, okay? So the third dimension is what we call semantic. This is where the, the, the question that the second person asked, like, how do you, uh, you know, do you know if they go to similar or dissimilar stores? That becomes very critical because here we're gonna be looking at, look at, look at this customer. This customer goes to four stores, right? A, B, C, D, but another customer who goes to the same four stores may have a different, you know, order. The first customer might go to A, B, C, D, but the second one might go to D, A, B, C, or D, C, B, A. You can think of many permutation combinations there, right? So we look at the stationary distribution of the visit probability of each site, the time that each of these people are spending at each of these stores, uh, and obviously from there we get the transition probability, and uh, we also get the time spent. Yeah, because you know some people are walking fast and some are fairly slow and some are you know moving at moderate speed. And so basically these are the four dimensions, right? So velocity, okay, semantic, then temporal, and then spatial. Okay. So these four dimensions are going to constitute the basic building blocks of our advertising targeting trajectory algorithm. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're going to say that if there are two customers, I and I prime, and imagine like this is me and Devjit, right? So the extent of similarity between Devjit and me is going to be a function of the similarity between us on each of these four dimensions, okay? And in the extreme case, if you're very similar, then the recommendations that are sent to me are going to be very similar to the recommendations that are sent to Debjit and vice versa. Okay? Um, and so, um, you know, there are various, obviously various ways to think about the similarity uh, score, right? And we looked at cosine distance, kernel functions, et cetera. And, you know, those are technicalities that at the end of the day, uh, they did not make much of a, you know, qualitative difference. 
uh, but the details are in the paper. But think about this as, as, as a starting point, we're gonna put equal weight on all of all four, okay? Okay, so that's the recommendation algorithm. We're going to uh, say that the offer sent to I prime, customer I prime, is going to be similar, dissimilar to I based on a function of these four dimensions, okay? So remember, we are not using demographics to find similarities. We are only looking at mobile location data here. Okay, trajectory data. Okay, so now let's talk about the experiment, right? So like I said, you know, we partnered with uh, several different corporate partners. One of them was one of the largest shopping malls in Asia. Uh, as you can see, it's a really big mall. It has about 1.3 million square feet, more than 300 stores. It gets about 100,000 visitors per day and about 200,000 visitors during the holidays. So how do we get the trajectory data? We do this through the Wi-Fi system. Okay? The moment a customer walks into the shopping mall, there is there's a team of people with flyers standing saying that, hey, do you want access to the Wi-Fi user ID and password? Uh, the reason customers often want that in a mall is, you know, sometimes the the, the LTE signal doesn't work very well in a shopping mall. Okay? especially if you go to a basement or, or some sort of corner of this mall or a department store, the signal becomes weak. But customers also like to do price comparison shopping on their smartphones, even while they're in a physical store. So, you know, they, they actually want internet access, right? So we tell these people that, okay, look, um, at the entrance, um, if you um, want your user ID and password, we have two options for you. You can opt in to share your trajectory data with us, in which case, you know, we will send you offers, discounts, okay? So 30% discount or whatever it is. Um, alternatively, you can opt out. You don't have to share your trajectory data with us. Um, you can still get access to the Wi-Fi, but you're not gonna get offers, okay? So the incentive is very clear. Uh, if you opt in to share your data, the company will send you price discounts. If you decide not to opt in, you can still access the internet, but you will not get the discount, okay? So the give and take uh, is very clear, right? Um, so what we saw was the lowest opt-in rate was 79%, meaning that four out of five customers over the period of our experiment would want to opt in to share the trajectory data and get re in return, you know, get these uh, you know, targeted offers. Okay? Um, so in addition to that, we also asked them to fill up a form with very simple demographic data like age, gender, income range. Um, we also corroborated that um, at the time when they were making a purchase, at the point of sale, we asked them for the same form just for cross-validation. In addition so for about, um, sorry, is there a question? Yeah, so there are a few questions yeah. related to this uh, slide in the previous one, I think. Yeah. Uh, so one was, of okay. course, you, what is the process to acquire the locational data? For example, did you partner with stores or the mobile companies? So how do you really right. get right. the data? And a related right. question is that, uh, did what happens if the GPS location is switched off? I think you already answered that because, yeah, if they are participating, willing to participate, yes or no. And right. the related question is that uh, what happens, or are you able to even combine your data with the customer search history? Mm -hmm. So these are some right. so, Okay, so uh, I'll take the, how does the uh, offer actually get executed? Now, you know how when you travel, when you go to an airport and you sit in a lounge and you, ask, you want to access the Wi-Fi, uh, like a browser pops out? Right, so you go to the lounge, the lounge uses the user ID password and the browser pops up, right? And say, fill up your user ID password. So this is the same technique that we use here, right? So this is not being done through an app uh, in some other parts of the world, like I've done this in Europe a few times. In Europe, I can do this through an app, right? Like in Germany or France, you can do this through an app. Now here in Asia, we did not want to send them an SMS message. We did not want to do this through an app. So we use a browser-based notification. It, it looks very much like an SMS message. It just pops up on your lock screen, home screen, and it tells you, you know, very, very two lines, two sentence offer, uh, uh, you know, hello, Debjit, you know, 25% discount for you for an Apple phone, something like that. 
Um, but yeah, this is called, uh, you know, Eddie Stone. This is very similar to Google's browser-based targeting called Eddie Stone. Okay. Uh, what was the other question that you? So the other question was, uh, did you also have access to the search history of the customer? And mm. if you have access, probably the confidence would be boosted further. Correct. No. So in this particular study, we did not use a search history uh, because we really wanted to keep it to pure location uh, trajectory based targeting. We did not want to conflate that. Um, we have other papers where we are using, you know, both online and offline data to look at the incremental effect. And, um, you know, um, the intuition of this questionnaire is right. Uh, there's a separate paper where we work with, uh, you know, companies like Alibaba, where we use their online search history along with offline location data. So you do see the benefit there. Sure, sure, sure. I think uh, we can continue. I'll take some of the questions again later. Okay, sure. Um, okay, so um, next, let's talk about the experimental design, right? So you understood the background here, right? So uh, the people sign into the Wi-Fi, we get the trajectory data, and then we will uh, think about four different groups. So the first is the control group. Naturally, we need a group that doesn't do it. get any offers. That's your control group. Then we're going to compare with three different treatment groups. The first is what we call a random uh, targeting technique, meaning that you might be standing in front of Starbucks, but you're getting an offer from, you know, a, a, a retailer apparel brand, okay? Completely unrelated to where you're standing. This is called randomized targeting. And, and some stores do that to see if they can entice the explorers to come to their store, okay? The second treatment group is based on pure location. So I'm standing in front of the apparel brand, let's say it's Levi's jeans, so I get an offer from Levi's jeans, okay? And the third is the trajectory. The trajectory is the one that we are most interested in. And there, if I first went to, let's say, Gucci, then went to Armani, then went to Prada, then went to some other designer brand, then the final offer will come from the, the, another designer brand because they know that I'm only interested in designer brands, right? So I go to Gucci, Armani, Prada, then Burberry might send me an offer, okay? So trajectory is you know, looking at that. So, like I said, you know, we carried this out over two weeks, partnering with these uh, these stores. Um, about 252 of these 300 stores opted in to partner with us. Uh, we each day we randomly assigned about 6,000 customers into each of these four groups, and uh, we looked at all the groups get the same offer, right? If since we are looking at comparisons, uh, but then we also had, you know, different subsets of offers, you know, like 50% off or buy one, get one free. So how do we execute this? We wait for the first 10 minutes of the customer. When they enter the mall, we look at the trajectory. Okay. And then we randomly allocate them into one of these groups. Okay. And like I said, this is an SMS like message, but it's not an SMS. Um, so it cannot be forwarded to anybody else, right? You're the only person who can redeem it. And uh, again, from an experimental design perspective, it's important to make sure that, you know, all three treatment groups have the same offer in terms of format and price discount, except that one is randomly targeted, one is location-based, and one is trajectory-based. Okay, so first I'll do some group-level analysis. Okay, so take a look at this. Um, you, you know, there's a bunch of different columns here. Look at redemption rates, the money spent in the focal store, the total money spent in the mall, the time in minutes that it took to, uh, for the person to redeem the offer, the satisfaction scores, and the time spent in the focal store along with the total time spent in the mall. Okay. So when you do these within group comparisons, you're already starting to see some model free evidence, what we call the stats. Right? So trajectory-based recommendation has the highest response rate, 31%. It's twice that of random and a good 30% higher than that of location. In addition to the high response rate, you also see that people are redeeming these offers much faster. The trajectory offer takes about five minutes to redeem. The location offer takes about two times more and the random offer takes about three times more. So people are responding more positively. They are also responding faster. So there's a very nice efficiency there, right? Like, second, when you look at 
time spent in the focal store, right? Uh, they are spending more money when you look at trajectory. They're spending about $56, which is more than how much they are spending on both random and location. Um, but they're also spending less time. So again, this is consistent with my previous uh, in a point about redemption rate. So part of the reason why spending less time in the store is, is generally good is because you don't want crowdedness. Remember, like we are targeting 6,000 people and you know, 1,500 in age group. We don't want like 1,500 people to end up in like you know, five different stores at the same time. Yeah, then it's going to explode, right? Um, so it's nice to see it's from an efficiency perspective that people are spending more money, but they're spending it very efficiently. Um, there's overall, this is the key, uh, a very important um, column, right? Remember, the, 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 you know, whatever insights we get from a field experiment, we have to demonstrate that the effect is over and above what would have happened anyway. Meaning that what if these people would have bought products anyway, even if you didn't send them mobile offers, right? That's a, that's a fundamental question. So there I'm showing you the, that for the control group, the people who don't get any of these offers, on an average, they spend $85. But the moment you start targeting them with some advertising offer, uh, their spending increases and, and it's the highest for trajectory. So location is good but trajectory is even better. And, and they're both significantly better than random targeting. So, so I just wanna make sure that you know, the experimental design is clear. And, and, and this comparison is a key comparison in, in any sort of in a mobile or any digital marketing paper, right? Anytime, whether it's the company or authors who are going for showing effectiveness, you have to demonstrate that you're showing effects over and above a baseline that would have happened anyway. Okay, so, so that's, uh, you know, that gives you some, hopefully some perspective on the um, overall, um, you know, means. Now, um, so again, location is better than random, but you know, random has a, a lower satisfaction rate. Some results on demographics, I'll, I'll try to expedite here. Um, we have age and income. You see that, you know, not surprisingly, like, you know, younger people tend to be redeeming more for the trajectory, right? Um, and but you know there there's some nuanced correlations with the income group as well it's effective very it's a lot more effective in the high income group which was uh, nice to see it also demystifies some myths in this business right so some brands worry that mobile targeting is only effective for you know uh, lower income categories that typically tend to ha don't tend to have high customer lifetime values it turns out that we actually saw quite consistently the opposite. Okay, now before I go to in the individual level modeling, any any questions I can clarify? And there are in fact a few questions if you're willing to take that now and yeah, sure. Uh, one question was how do you identify the income group here? Okay, so so two ways. Good question. The first is at the time when they enter the mall, you know, when they get the user ID password for the Wi-Fi, we also ask them to fill out a simple form asking them to give the demographics. Second, we also have 77% of the customers of this mall have a loyalty card. And using the loyalty card data, we have prior information about their income demographics. Okay. Okay. And then a few other questions, which is maybe a technical question. Uh, so instead of GPS location, can we use some Bluetooth or other mechanisms to obtain these special calculations and targeting techniques? Yeah, so instead of Wi-Fi, you know, yes. Um, like I said, in, in Europe, I've used, uh, my co authors and I, we have used Bluetooth and the mobile app extensively. So, you know, the issue with Bluetooth is uh, basically it's, you know, if you have an app, if you've downloaded the shopping malls app, then yes, you can target them using Bluetooth, but Bluetooth also has limited distance. You know, depending on the power of the Bluetooth, maybe 15 feet. But the biggest constraint is, you know, not only about 20% of shopping mall customers would have downloaded the app. People don't download apps. So if we were only using Bluetooth and apps, you would be only restricted to like 20% of the population. But with this sort of, you know, browser-based technique, we are, we have unlimited, uh, there, there's no constraint. Basically, anybody who opts in can be sent an offer. Okay. So there are two questions, but I think you answered both of them now, which was, 
Jitin's question on why do you need the velocity information? Mm -hmm. Is it to check how fast you're reading the offer, which you answered that. The second Correct. question was that, do the offers can be redeemed only at the mall or somewhere else as well? So that's only at the mall. Only at the mall. Only at the yeah, mall. it's only yeah. at the mall and only within the specific store that is sending you that offer. So it cannot be transferred outside. It, you cannot even email it or to a friend or family. Um, it is specifically sent to a user's phone using the browser. So only that user can uh, redeem that offer. Yeah. So there is another follow-up question uh, by Deep. He says, mm -hmm. at, a, at a point of a person eyes trajectory, there can be some other top X persons with whom the similarity of the person I can be above some predefined threshold. So how do you decide when to send an offer? Right, so, so it's a very good question. Um, you know, part of the answer to that question is, you know, in a separate follow-up paper, we also looked at social dynamics, meaning that is the customer shopping alone or are they shopping with family or friends? And the shopping with family or friends, are they shopping in a group of two or a group of three or four and so on? So uh, we have a separate paper, it's also available in SSRN, it's called Nudging Customers by Social Dynamics. You'll see that it does make a difference. In fact, we see that um, when people are shopping in larger groups, like groups of three, they tend to be even more responsive to um, these offers. The other question I heard was, when do you send them offers, right? So there we have to be consistent. Uh, every person gets the offer 10 minutes after they walk into the mall, okay? okay. We did not want any heterogeneity in the timing because then we get less information or more information for different people. Um, we also replicated the same experiment with a 20 minute timing. Every customer gets the offer after 20 minutes. Um, but there, the trade off is very simple. The more you delay sending the offer, the more information you might get about them, but the less opportunities you might get to send them the right offer because they may have already exhausted their shopping time or part of it. Okay, so there's a very clear trade out there, right? Um, and so finally we settled with 10 minutes because on an average people are spending about one hour, uh, 45 minutes to about one hour in a shopping trip on a weekday. On a weekend they spend more time. Um, and so, you know, the 10 minute interval gave us enough data about what might be of interest to them so that we can spend the remaining 40 minutes targeting them with the offers. Okay. Okay. So there are two questions uh, which are related to the usage of the modeling practice. Uh, yeah. One question is, what is the minimum threshold of the mall customers who need to consent to data sharing for this model to be used in real life? Mm -hmm. Can you please mute it? Okay. Yeah. So the other is, uh, is there a need to update the model to adapt to changing customer behavior? So how frequently should we right. update the model? Yeah. Yeah, so the first question is straightforward. So we, we basically ask people uh, with full transparency, right? We give them a choice of opt-in or opt-out. So, you know, uh, and I've, I've done a bunch of work on privacy and one of the things I've learned over time is it's very important to have like, you know, notice and choice. Notify first people what you're doing and then give them a choice. So we make it very clear that if you opt in, you will get these discounted offers. You're, you're giving us your data and we are giving you back, you know, some discount. So about 79% of people do opt in on a daily basis. So one in uh, four out of five people opt in. Uh, the other question is very interesting. Yes, so you're absolutely right. Over time, we do see, so there's two things we can do with trajectory, right? One is we can essentially based on your past trajectory, we can predict where you will go and then we can essentially act upon that same behavior. And you know, if you came to buy, let's say you're traveling, you came to buy a luggage, right? So uh, you need a large suitcase, right? And there are five different brands. Uh, we observe you going to two brands first and then we send you offers from one of the other three brands. We can do that. In the, in the long term, we also see your other shopping preferences. So we can update the algorithm in real time, periodically, and not real time, but periodically with additional information and say, look, maybe instead of sending him an offer from a luggage store, uh, this customer is much more likely to spend more money on apparel maybe. So instead of sending you an offer from a luggage store, we're gonna send you an offer from an apparel store. So 
so uh, you know, I think the, the intuition is very much accurate. So we have done these, you know, uh, behavior modifying changes in the algorithms over time, because um, you know this is this is the first uh, paper that we wrote. Over time, we've written other papers on this, uh, but uh, the intuition is very much spot on. So Anil, I'll just take one more question before uh, we move on, uh, okay. if possible. Uh, is the question is that uh, did you consider explorers? versus focus shoppers, so how do you? Yes, 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 absolutely. In fact, that's exactly what I'll get to now. So thank you. Okay, thanks so maybe you, take, you go ahead and we'll continue from here, yeah? Right, so, um, you know, we, so this is a very simple, you know, choice model, like logit like model, and we are saying, what is the probability of redemption of a given customer as a function of the various characteristics, you know, like age and income, gender, credit card, whatever, all the information that we have, and then the treatment is one of the three, right? Randomized, location, or trajectory. Okay, and then we control for the other day of the week variables, time of the day, coupon type, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so here's the basic, the first set of results. So look at this trajectory, right? So remember the random location is, random targeting is our baseline. So compared to the baseline, people who are getting trajectory-based offers are more likely to redeem offers. And both location and trajectory perform better than random, but trajectory performs about three times better than location. Okay. Um, when you look at weekend, weekend customers tend to be like um, on an average, right, better than weekday. Afternoon and evening are on, on an average better than morning. Okay. Um, then we have some other, you know, like I said, age is negatively correlated like you know the older you get uh, the less likely you will actually be redeeming the offers that's not a surprise thing um but then look at what happens over here even though the trajectory based offers are generally the best performing but on the weekend we find that trajectory is not performing as well in fact they're performing worse than random or even sometimes location okay so part of this is this whole impulse buys thing. So, you know, on a weekend, your trip to a shopping mall is often a social trip with the family or friends, and you're not in any rush, right? Like, this is not an efficiency game for you. You don't mind exploring that for a couple of hours. So, so the person who asked this question about explorers versus the shoppers, you will see that on a weekday, trajectory performs better because people tend to be more focused you know, maybe because they're coming back from office or they have less time. But on the weekend, trajectory does not perform as well. In fact, the random offers tend to perform better. And that's where, you know, the explorers come in. Okay? So um, there's, a, there's a long, you know, lit, uh, list of marketing, psychology of literature on this uh, issue of explorers versus uh, shoppers. And, you know, we've described that in the paper. But, okay. Um, now let's look at the individual spending in the focal store. On an average, right, consistent with the main result, again, trajectory is better than location, but is better than random. Weekend tends to be better than weekday. There's no significant interaction effects um, for the focal store. Um, and more importantly, you know, the focal store is always benefiting, so there's no major heterogeneity in the direct effects. Okay. Um, so overall spending in the mall, overall what we find is that trajectory is again, less affected during weekends. Random is more affected during weekends. And uh, there are some demographic effects like uh, males and higher income people tend to be more responsive to these targeting techniques on the trajectory basis. And we find that uh, there is some heterogeneity in the indirect effect of mobile advertising on the overall spending. Okay, so this was the uh, slide where, um, you know, I want to talk a little more about the focus shopper versus explorers, right? So, you know, one, when we replicated this in sh different shopping malls, we also partnered with some airports, you know, because airports have large retail, if you look at like the Dubai Emirates terminal, for example, or Singapore's Changi Airport, or even like, you know, Mumbai's uh, Chhatrapati, the new version, you know, we have a fairly large, like retail establishments there, right? So many of the airport authorities that we have worked with had asked the same question that, you know, uh, somebody in the audience asked, right, which is, uh, when is this fine grain movement data most useful, right? And for that, we had to sort of separate 
focus shoppers versus explorers. Okay. Um, and again, you know, that's where the velocity data is useful, but also sort of the, the heterogeneity in the categories of the stores that you visit, right? If you're a focus shopper, you're basically moving among the same category, right? Same stores. There we find the trajectory based ads are more effective. So there the fine grain data really helps. For the explorers, right? Actually, trajectory data is not as helpful. It turns out that the randomized ads tend to be much more helpful, especially on the weekend. Okay. So one of our you know, main takeaways here was that look, you know, the contrast between explorers and shoppers matters, uh, explorers and focus shoppers matters. Also, you have to combine that, you know, with the weekday versus the weekend effect. Okay, so to, to summarize the main takeaways, right? So here's what we find. So, you know, this was the first, um, you know, paper and also the first of its kind real world execution of what we call trajectory based targeting, right? So our hypothesis was that, you know, trajectory gives you more information and these algorithms should be able to perform better than location based targeting. And do we in fact find that, yes, you know, they have higher redemption rates, more spending, more satisfaction, et cetera. There's some interesting demographic differences between gender and income as well. Um, quite uh, it was a pleasant surprise to see that, you know, these high income people, the ones with the high customer lifetime value tend to be more responsive to these offers. Okay? And uh, we find that the focal stores are always benefiting. Also, indirectly, overall mall revenues are higher. So the, the, the central establishment also benefits because you're spending more money. Um, and on an average, you're doing this in a more efficient way, right? You're spending less time. Um, so um, maybe I have another five minutes before I stop. Uh, Devji, if that's okay. Sure. Um, because I think one of the, one of the questions that somebody had asked was, you know, what about social groups and you know, how does that affect people's shopping? Uh, so we followed this up with you know, a few different uh, set of analysis, one of which was this contrast comparing a single shopper with you know, a couple or a group of three or a group of four. Okay? So um, I probably won't have time to get into the details, but also it was a large scale field experiment uh, with about 52,000 different unique user responses. This one we did over three weeks. So once we got you know, these early set of results from the malls, they were more responsive to participating with us over a longer time. And, and here, you know, we looked at comparing a single solo shopper with uh, a couple with, uh, like with a group of three or a group of four and so on. Okay? Um, again, here we had the same algorithm. We had location-based targeting, trajectory-based targeting, random targeting, et cetera. Here we use a classic, what we call a different diff, right? Uh, method, right? So, so the, there's basically two sets of differences here, right? Um, each in the control group, again, we have about 2,500 people, right? And there the two levels of different diff. The first is basically the baseline difference in spending across the different social contexts, right? Are you basically uh, spending, are you in a single or dyad or triad, et cetera? And the second difference is the difference in the, uh, the discrepancy in the difference with and without mobile intervention, okay? So the, at the high level, again, we find that a large group, a group of three, you will see over here, consumers in the group of three will redeem more than couples in a group of two or six solo shoppers. So there clearly is a very, you know, a very clear non-trivial social effect there, okay? Um, and you know it comes it actually increases the spending as well there's higher spending in the mall you know there's a little more time so for 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 those of us who are thinking about you know does your shopping get influenced by a group uh, it does in fact in the 70s uh, there was a paper by a social psychologist who had theorized that when people go to shop if they shop with their family they are going to spend less than if they shop with their friends because your family essentially knows your net worth and you don't have to essentially flaunt, you know, what your net worth is. With your friends, there's often some peer pressure in flaunting your wealth or your income. Um, and so in this paper, we actually found that to be true. So again, um, you know, uh, it was nice to see the hypothesis come true that there is some peer pressure when you're out with friends, you will spend the same person spending more money when they're with friends and then with family. 
Okay, so I'll end here uh, just to say summarize what we think you know are the contributions of this paper. So we are ex you know obviously excited because this was the first one where we were able to extract consumer preferences from large scale fine grain mobile data, um, and we were also um, you know the first to look at trajectory based targeting. And then we evaluated them using these randomized field experiments by partnering with shopping malls uh, in, in these papers. And I think you know what is interesting here is that essentially we are combining online and offline, right? So we are combining your offline data with the online targeting on your mobile phone. And uh, you know this 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 is the you know it, it's sort of scratching the tip of the iceberg here because there's a lot more that can be done you know that needs to be done and and, and we hope that you know this sort of research can uh, motivate you know more of us to pursue pursue this line um, so I'll end here and you know in case you're interested in some related work uh, we have a couple of working papers looking at privacy as well um, using smartphone data the uh, the first one is about the impact of privacy in the COVID crisis because of contact tracing. And this paper is also available on SSRN or you can always email me. Uh, then we have a separate paper where we build a privacy framework to basically balance this risk reward uh, process. You know, like consumers want to share more data. Companies want to give them price discounts or, or some economic offer. And how do we balance that okay? so that brands and your partners. So I'll end here and, and see if you have any questions and then happy to happy to take them. Well, thank you, Anandia, for this such an engaging talk. We have a flood of questions now. <laughs> so I will uh, take some of, I'll give you some of the questions, maybe I'll combine a few as appropriate. Okay. Uh, one okay. question is on, can a person lie in multiple groups like T2 and T3? And is it possible that you recommend the same offer for location and trajectory? No, so it's very important that you know the groups are absolutely distinct. There's no overlap at all. So a given customer on a given day, right, or at least during the part of the two or three week experiment can only be in one group. Uh, we don't want to contaminate the group, so there's no learning effects there. Otherwise, you know, people might learn, right? So, and we don't want to contaminate that. Okay. And your phone number is helpful for us in uniquely identifying you so that if you don't, you know, replicate this, a different offer or put you in a different group. Okay. There's a follow-up question on like, how is the total spending captured in the month? I think you already mentioned that it's offline data, right? That's a... Right. So the total spending is you're basically, you know, all the 250 stores that are participating with us, they are sharing their point of sales data for each of the customers in our experimental groups, right? So at the end of each day, we are getting an automated feed from them, from their point of sale for each of these customers. And then we simply just, you know, add them all up cumulatively. How much has a customer spent across all the stores in the mall? Okay. So there's another question on, doesn't trajectory compared to control end up self-selecting customers who have a high propensity to come to the store compared to control and hence high spend rate and high conversions? Uh, no, so the reason there is no self-selection here, right? Because the, the, the experiment is fully randomized, right? So the randomization takes care of any potential self-selection, right? Um, so the, the the cause for concern would have been if we had a very low opt-in rate. Suppose you are getting an opt-in rate of 20%. Then you might say that, you know, uh, well, you know, people who uh, are, are not opting in, they're really not interested in these offers. So we might be able to, we might be confounding the effect you're seeing here. But turns out, like I said, you know, 79%, the, the minimum opt-in rate we saw was 79%. So four out of five people opting in. Once they opt in, right, they don't know which group they're gonna be in, right? It's our algorithm that is randomly allocating them. So there's no self-selection here. So people don't have the choice of saying, oh, I wanna be in location or I wanna be in trajectory or I wanna be in random, right? They don't know, they don't see us. We are behind the scenes, right? We are randomly allocating them. Okay. Uh, and then observing their behavior, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, also an interesting question, which is more about how do we replicate the trajectory mapping methodology in the online space, like using a mobile yeah. app or? 
Yeah, it's a great question. In fact, I'm working on some of that uh, in, a, in a non-academic setting, I'm, you know, uh, uh, advising a bunch of startups in South Korea um, and also here in the U.S. on that. So I'll tell you this, that, you know, at the high level, um, what we did is we were the first to build, think about this as a recommender system in the offline world, right? So you know how Amazon and Netflix, they have done this for years, right? But in the online world, what they did is people who buy this book also buy that book, also buy that book, right? Or people who watch this movie also buy, watch that movie and watch that movie. And we are saying, well, people who go to Gucci may also go to Ar Armani and Prada, and et cetera, et cetera, right? So in the, in the online world, in the pure sort of e-commerce world, there is a stream of work in clickstream data analysis that you know marketing professors like Alan Montgomery and Peter Bothfire and Shibo Lee. Shibo is one of the foremost experts on that. He's done a bunch of work there. Um, but what we did was we basically said, look, nobody's done this in the offline world. Now, what does the future here look like? Like I said, I think the future is going to be a combination of merging the same customers online browsing searching data with that same customer's offline location or trajectory data. So this is a, a working paper that we have now. Um, it is with the PhD student, Chen Shuo san He's a third year student at NYU. And you know this is part of his dissertation thesis. Um, and so you can look it up. Um, it's also on SSRN, otherwise you can just email us. We are showing that by combining online and offline, you're gonna do significantly better than pure online or pure offline, okay? Um, except that, you know, like in this particular paper was uh, the first to sort of experimentally test it, but as you can imagine, there's a lot more work that can be done and hopefully, you know, will be done. So if another question from uh, Shrikumar is, is, how did you control for store layout level changes, especially when identifying explorers versus focus shoppers? Yeah, so great question. Um, you know, like I said, we are able to identify uh, not only if you're going to a store, but also how much time you're spending in the store. And then within the store, what is your trajectory, you know, like going from aisle to aisle or shelf to shelf. So it's, it's very granular data because remember, the smartphone is giving us your location trajectory uh, within, within one feet with 91% accuracy and uh, within three feet with 97% accuracy. So because of that accuracy levels, right, uh, not only do we know which stores you're going to, but how much time you're spending and also where exactly within that store you're, you're going or you're at. Okay. So uh, there's one more question, the redemption of the uh, offers is like, are the offers sent redeemed on any product in the store or are there some limitations on the redemptions? Right. Right. No, great question. Um, our, our baseline experiments were very open-ended, meaning that when you get an offer from the store, we say it's a 20% discount on basically any category within the store. Um, but, you know, in sort of other follow-up uh, projects, you've looked at some differences as well. Uh, suppose we only sort of send offers from certain categories in a given store, like does that make a big difference? It doesn't really make much of a difference. Uh, you'll see now in our paper, the SSRN version has a, a section, a subsection on, you know, uh, store heterogeneity as well. So our, our, fashion, our, our apparel stores, you know, better than dining stores versus groceries versus luggage, you know, you'll see that. Um, and you'll see that we find that there are no, like, you know, stark differences across categories. There is some heterogeneity which gets captured in a, in a quantitative manner using the coefficients. Uh, but, you know, not, there aren't like that many stores that really stand out um, as, you know, remarkably different. Okay. So there's other question on uh, whether you, you, is there has been an option to go beyond the GPS and mm -hmm. look at something like mobile Viala data or some other dependencies on mobile operators is so less feasible. So, yeah, so, you know, one of the things we can do is um, in, in Europe, you know, we, it is, it's not very easy to get sort of regulatory clearance, right? So, so in Asia, it's relatively easier to get regulatory clearance. Like I've worked with um, five or six different telecom companies around the world. So in, in Germany, China, US, 
South Korea, um, you know, South America, etc. I would say that Europe probably is the most strictest in terms of, you know, the sort of data sharing. And what does work over there is, we did work with German Telecom, Telefonica there, uh, but they said that, you know, we can leverage mobile app data. In other words, get the customers to download the mobile app. And then from the app, the, there's a software SDK for location. So you can actually, you know, uh, get location data from that. So instead of the telecom providers giving us data, we got the, in China or in South Korea or you know uh, other parts of the world, you can work directly with the telecom providers or with the platform. Okay. Um, in Europe, you'll have to work with the mobile app developer, the app company. Okay. So I think we'll take one more question. I mean, I know we are cognizant of time, and it's already yeah. seven thirty here, so I think you have one of the meeting to go as well. The other question is. Are we sending offer single times or multiple times? So is it like a single time offer? Only only one time. You're only sending an offer one time uh, to a given customer within a given group uh, because you know again we didn't want to confound or contaminate with you know like given giving a different number of offers to different people. There is a related question though that needs to be answered, which is you know what is the optimal number of offers to be sent? Okay. Now, in a different paper, uh, this was a joint work with uh, another PhD student who's now a professor at Emory University, Gosset and School of Business, her name is Wilma Todri. This was published in, MIS, in ISR, you'll see that paper. We show that when it comes to digital advertising, you know, um, like display ads, the optimal number of offers is between four and six, okay? So below four offers, uh, there's not enough awareness or interest in the customer to act on those offers. And above six offers, it becomes too much. It is like people get tuned out. It's overwhelming. So there's a sweet spot for advertising between four and six, um, you know, depending on the category, uh, there's that range. So. Okay, and so how are we doing with time? Would you be able to take a few more questions or you think you're just up yeah, to time? I have to go, unfortunately. I have okay. a Dean's meeting now. No, I think it's, it's great. I think many of the questions that are remaining are modern related questions and I hope the audience can get the answers from your paper or your working paper as well, right? right? So thank you, Indy right. India, for joining us for this evening here and morning at your time. I hope next time we'll be able to host you in person at IMA.